Hey, brothers and sisters, uh, let's jump back into the scriptures really quick. I, I hope you've enjoyed these these short little uh, 10, 15 minute uh, excursions into the New Testament and into the dialogue of, uh, of the Savior and, and those around him. Uh, the question we're going to focus on today comes from the Sermon on the Mount, which is, I, without question, God, of, it, it, without question has to be uh, in the top sermons ever given, if not the top sermon ever given by the Savior. And uh, in this sermon, it kind of helps to understand and, and break down this particular question. It kind of helps to put the whole sermon in context. Uh, ultimately, what the Savior is doing with this in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount is taking the, the, these people who had kind of become accustomed to a level of living under the law of Moses and is asking them to now raise their sights. He, he wants to not just raise their sights, but to raise their conduct. He's trying to lift them from this celestial eye for an eye, um, do unto me and I'll do it unto you kind of a living, which, is, which really is a natural way to live. Uh, it's, it's very instinctive. Uh, when I get hit, I want to hit back. And the Savior's saying, you know, that, that may be fine for those who are happy with the, the rewards that a terrestrial world uh, or a telestial world offers, but Heavenly Father has something greater. Heavenly Father has celestial rewards waiting for those who will, who will seek them and who will be willing to live according to them. And so uh, at the end of this, uh, at the end of chapter five, as he's transitioning in the Sermon on the Mount, he's speaking about loving your neighbors and he's saying, look, you, you've heard it said, and he says that phrase several times. You've heard it said this, and you've heard it said that. You used to live like this, but if you want Heavenly Father's celestial reward, then you need to live a higher standard. You need to live to a higher conduct. And at the end of chapter 5, as he's talking about loving your neighbors, he says, if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Uh, and I, I love the International Standard version of that because it kind of, it, it adds a little bit of emphasis to it. He says, if you greet only your relatives, that's no great thing you're doing, is it? In other words, how much of a reward do you deserve for being kind to those around you, those that you are in your circle of trust? How, how much of a reward do you need for, or, or should you get for doing that which comes naturally? Uh, and, and this idea of reward really plays out, especially in the next chapter. Uh, in chapter 6, the first several verses, the Savior hits on this idea of reward. Uh, he says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. If you're going to do things with the same motivations and for the same purposes that the world does them, then you're going to be limited to the reward that the world gets. There is no celestial, there is no celestial reward for celestial lifestyles. And so he, and he goes on and he says, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. See, that's the celestial reward. The celestial reward is the glory of those around us. You'll get the world's reward. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They got the glory of men. People thought they're great people because of all their, their service. The Savior says, instead, here's what I want you to do, but when you doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. If you want celestial rewards, you've got to live a celestial lifestyle, and you've got to have celestial motivations. So back in verse 5 again, he's... he's he emphasizes this, this point of, you know, doing that which comes naturally is not that big a deal. Treating those that you already love with respect and admiration, uh, it, it doesn't bring with it any reward because it's easy. Um, he says, uh, to kind of in the verses surround that, he says, that ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Uh, there's the standard. That's the celestial lifestyle. You have one, there is one standard for how you treat people, and it is, it, it is you use that standard regardless of who you're dealing with. 
So if you want to be a, if you want to be children of the uh, of our Father in heaven, in, in word and deed, we have to be like our Father in heaven and treat others the way our Father in heaven treats them. Uh, so he says, for if you love them which love you, what reward have you? So just a note worth you know, spending some time with and maybe contemplating a little bit is this idea is the fact that the same, the same Jesus that is now expecting a higher standard of living is the same Jehovah that gave Moses the law of Moses. And, and you can see this progression that the savior is, is taking the children of Israel through this natural progression. At first, I'm going to teach you how to be a good human being, just a, a good telestial person. <laughs> but there comes a point in each of our individual journeys where that's no longer good enough. Uh, there comes a point when we have, to, we have to raise our standards, we have to raise our expectations because, like I've said, we're, we're not going to be happy with telestial rewards. At the end of the day, we're here to gain a celestial reward, and that comes through celestial living. It comes through mimicking and following the, the pattern that's been set by our Father in Heaven and the Savior, Jesus Christ. Telestial living, the, these, these old ways of living that we've left in the past are not good enough for disciples of Christ. We have to live differently. What more do you do? Well, we have to do more. Later on, Jesus is going to tell his disciples to love one another. And then he says, this is how the world is going to know that you are my disciples. Because you will treat other people the way nobody else treats them. The world treats its tribes well. Just go on, in, just go on Instagram, go on Facebook. On our social media tribes... There is this massive us versus them. And the, the people that are a part of our Facebook groups or our Instagram followers or our Snapchat snappies, whatever you call them, like we pour on the praise and we're gentle with the, with the chastising. But anyone that's outside of that circle, whether it's social media or, or reality, we have a tendency to be, we, we can have a tendency, the, the world has a tendency to be overly critical. And the Savior's call here is, I expect you to do more than the world does. So we can't allow ourselves to compare our behavior or justify our behavior um, to those in the world or, or based on those in the world because the Savior has called us to live a higher law. He's called us to live a higher standard. And with that standard comes a higher reward. And so the question I'd like you to just think about is your, your interactions with people outside of your tribes. Of course you treat your family well. Of course you treat your friends well. But people outside of your tribes, especially interactions in social media, uh, do you have a tendency to be overly harsh or critical? Or do you extend them the, the benefit of the doubt? What are the stories you tell yourself about other people's behaviors and other people's motivations? As you think about those things, remember the Savior's, uh, the Savior's commendation at the very beginning of this sermon when he said, you are the light of the world. If our light bulbs don't glow any brighter than anyone else's, how is anyone going to see the Savior through our influence? It's my testimony that as we live according to the, the Savior's expectations, then the promise at the end of Matthew chapter 5 will come true. And I, I really like time, Thomas Wayman's uh, rendition. You can, he's, he's got a, a study Bible where he's gone through and has kind of given a, 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 new, a new version of, of this account. And instead of, the King James Version says, puts it in kind of a command form, and this can be daunting. Be therefore perfect. Thomas Wayman has, has changed that a little bit in his, in his reading and rendering of this, this passage. His says, therefore ye will be perfect. And I think there, there holds a promise for those who are willing to try and, and hold themselves to that higher standard. Uh, as, you, as you do your best to treat others the way the Savior would treat them, you'll find that the Savior's promise of, of perfection unfolding slowly in your life. And while it may not completely come to pass, you'll, you'll notice the progress. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.